So right now at Concordia, we're in this series. It is on the Old Testament book of Leviticus. And Leviticus is one of those books that if you've ever read it, the first time you read it, it probably made you go, whoa, what in the world is this? Because you read it and it's just kind of weird. It is full of rules and regulations and stipulations and legislation. A lot of scholars who study Leviticus, they actually think this was a constitutional document for the formation of the ancient nation of Israel, which in our day kind of makes us go, well, how in the world does that apply to me? After all, the ancient nation of Israel was a long time ago, and it was in a place far away, so what could that possibly mean for me today? And yet in this series, we are learning that right beyond and beneath and behind all of the rules and regulations and stipulation and legislation is actually a bit of divine revelation. God is the one who explicitly claims to have authored this book. And so this book is not just a list of do's and do nots. God actually talks about in this book what he has done for his people. And what he did for his people of old, he still does for his people right now, for you and for me. Which is why this book is worth our time, our attention, and our study. And so today, as we continue our study of this book... We come to Leviticus chapter 23. In fact, if you got a Bible, you can open there to Leviticus 23. And i got to tell you, I'm kind of excited to be able to preach on Leviticus 23 because Leviticus 23, if you want to know the whole theme of the chapter, I'm going to give it to you in one sentence. Leviticus 23 says, it is time to party. That's like the whole chapter, okay? If you want to know what it's about, that's what it's about. You can break out the chicken wings and the pizza. You can break out the cake and the ice cream. You can bring the veggie tray that nobody really wants to eat, but you got to bring one to every single party anyway. And you can celebrate because that's what Leviticus 23 is all about. In fact, in Leviticus 23, here's what God does. He outlines a series of six annual celebrations that he commands and demands his people to observe. God basically says to his people, I don't care whether or not you want to have a good time with me, you are going to have a good time. And so six times a year, I want you to party. In fact, just to kind of get a a lay of the land of this chapter, I want to begin by just running through these six celebrations in Leviticus 23 uh, so that you understand what they are and what they mean. And so we'll start with the first celebration in Leviticus 23, which is the annual celebration of the Passover. Now, the Passover commemorates a time when God rescued the nation of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. Uh, The story goes like this. Uh, The Israelites had been slaves to the Egyptians for years and years and years, and God was getting kind of tired of that, and so he sends a series of ten plagues against the Egyptians, and the Egyptians finally get sick of having everything in their lives ruined, and so they let the people of Israel go in the middle of the night. Uh, But when they get let go finally, the people of Israel need to take some provisions with them, and so they need to take some food because they're fixing to leave their homes in Egypt, and so they begin to bake some bread, but they got to get out of Dodge so fast that they don't have time to let the bread rise. And so they basically make for themselves flat bread or unleavened bread, and so whenever the Israelites would celebrate the Passover and remember how God rescued them out of their slavery in Egypt, they would always eat unleavened bread. Uh, They would eat flat bread. It was part of the party. Uh, So that's the first celebration in Leviticus 23. Second celebration in Leviticus 23 is known as the party of the first fruits. Now, this took place in the early spring, and it was basically a harvest festival. Uh, When the first bit of fruit would grow on a tree, or when the first bit of grain would come up from the land, uh, the religious leaders in ancient Israel, they would lead Israel in this big party giving thanks to God for the first of the fruits, hence the name First Fruits. And basically, this was a Thanksgiving party, but it was also an expectation party, that just as God made the first crops grow, God was going to give them a bounty in just a few weeks that they were going to be able to celebrate, and this leads us to the next celebration, because seven weeks after the celebration of the first fruits, we get the celebration of weeks. And this was at the end of the spring growing season. It was another party, it was another harvest festival where the Israelites would bring in all of their crops and they would give thanks to God for providing them with the food that they needed. Now, at the end of the spring, after the third celebration, uh, the Israelites would take a little break for the summer. And then once the fall hit, they would start partying again because next in Leviticus 23, uh, we have uh, what is called the Feast of Trumpets. Now, the Feast of Trumpets is basically the ancient Jewish version of the New Year. Uh, When we celebrate the New Year, we set off fireworks, make a lot of noise. When they celebrated the New Year, they would blow a bunch of trumpets, make a bunch of noise, and they would ask God for another good year. 
Now, hot on the heels of the Feast of Trumpets would come the Day of Atonement. And uh, we talked about the Day of Atonement a couple of weeks ago. Uh, The Day of Atonement was a moment when the Israelites would celebrate that the God that they worshipped was not just righteous and just, he was also forgiving and merciful. And so they would celebrate the forgiveness of God, how God had atoned for their sins on the Day of Atonement. And then the sixth and final celebration they would celebrate every single year uh, was known as the Festival of the Tabernacles. Now, the Festival of the Tabernacles uh, went back to the story where Israel got rescued out of their slavery from Egypt, because after they got rescued out of their slavery from Egypt, uh, they went into the desert and they stayed there for 40 years. And when they were in the desert for 40 years, they lived in tabernacles or tents, and God protected them and provided for them for 40 years. And so during the festival of tabernacles, uh, the Israelites would basically go on a camp out. Uh, They would camp out in tents for seven days in commemoration of how God had provided for them for 40 years when they were camping out in the wilderness. And so these these are the six big celebrations in Leviticus 23. Now, Now, before we go any further, we need to ask a very important question. And the question is this, why? Why in the world would God make such a big deal out of these celebrations? Why would he say to his people, I want you to have fun or else? Why would God do something like that? Well, here's the best way that I know how to explain it. How many of you in here cannot stand to party? You hate to celebrate. You like to walk around with bitterness and resentment in your soul. You walked into church this morning not ready to worship God, but with a scowl on your face and scorn in your heart. How many of you just love to be miserable all of the time? Raise your hand. How many of you are sitting next to somebody like that? Raise their hand. (laughs) Don't, no, 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 don't do that. But here's the point. I've asked that question at three services now. You know how many people have raised their hands? No one. Because there is something in the human heart that is just kind of hardwired to party. There's something in the human soul that is hardwired to celebrate. Because celebrations provide our souls with really important things. They fill our hearts with really precious things, and that's what we're going to be talking about today in today's message. We're going to be talking about what these celebrations provide for people, what God is hoping to give his people in these celebrations. And so, three things in today's message that God wants to give to his people in these celebrations. And the first thing is this, in these celebrations, God wants to give to his people rest. In these celebrations, God wants to give to his people rest. Before these six annual celebrations in Leviticus 23, God actually opens the chapter with a weekly celebration that he wants his people to have. It's a celebration that is known as the Sabbath. Uh, We read this a little bit earlier in today's service. Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses and he said to him, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed times, the times of the Lord, that you will proclaim as sacred assemblies. Work may be done for six days, but on the seventh day there is to be a Sabbath of complete rest, a sacred assembly. You are not to do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord wherever you live. God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Not just annually, but weekly. Once a week, I want you to kick your feet up. I want you to kick back, and I want you to relax. I want you to stop doing all of your normal work. In fact, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, and so the Hebrew word for Sabbath is the Hebrew word Shabbat. It is a word in Hebrew that means stop, and so the name of the day actually describes the function of the day. On this day, you are supposed to stop. Just take a break. Now, this day, this weekly celebration of the Sabbath, actually formed the foundation for all of the annual celebrations in Leviticus 23 that come after it, because every single one of these celebrations were meant to give God's people rest. And so like the celebration of the Passover, Leviticus 23 verse 7, God says, you are not to do any daily work. I want you to stop. Or the celebration of weeks in verse 21, God says again, you are not to do any daily work. I want you to stop. Or the day of atonement in verse 31, God says you are not to do any work. I want you to stop. Now, part of the reason this would have been so poignant for the ancient Israelites has to do with what they have just come out of. They have just come out of over 400 years of being in Egypt when Leviticus 23 is is written. 
And for a lot of those years, they were slaves. And you know what you cannot do when you are a slave? You cannot Shabbat. You cannot stop. Because when you're a slave, your whole identity is rooted in what you do. How many bricks can you bake? How many structures can you build? How many tasks can you complete? But now that God has rescued his people out of their slavery in Egypt, God says, hey, I want you to do this a little bit differently. I don't want you to find your identity in what you can do. I want you to find your identity simply in the fact that you are. That you are mine. That you are loved by me. That you are freed by me. This is what the Sabbath is. It is a celebration and a recognition that the Israelites have been freed from their slavery. Uh, There's a pastor out of New York City. His name is Timothy Keller, and I love the way he talks about the Sabbath. He says, anybody who cannot obey God's command to observe the Sabbath is a slave, even if they're a self-imposed one. Your own heart, our materialistic culture, an exploitative organization, all of the above will be abusing you if you don't have the ability to be disciplined in your practice of a Sabbath. Sabbath is a declaration of your freedom. It means you're not a slave, not to your culture's expectations, not to your family's hopes, not to your medical school's demands, not even to your own securities. Uh, Here's what Timothy Keller is saying. He's saying you can tell what you are a slave to by what you are unable not to do. What is it that you can't stop doing? You're, You're a slave to that. So if you can't stop working... You always got to get stuff done. You know what you're a slave to. You're a slave to your job. Or maybe you got these emotions that you can't quite seem to get a handle on, right? An emotion of fear. You're always scared of something. An emotion of bitterness. You resent someone. Maybe an emotion of anger. You're holding a grudge against someone. And you try to let all that go, but you can't quite seem to let it go. You know what you're a slave to? You're a slave to your own emotions. Heck, maybe you're like a family person, right? Right? Good mom, good dad, good husband, good wife, good grandfather, grandmother, aunt, uncle, whoever. And yet, you're always trying to help out your family, even when maybe it's best to say no, but you can never say no. You always feel like you have to say yes. You know what you're a slave to, right? You're a slave to your family. God says, I don't want you to live in slavery like that. I want you to receive rest. I want you to be able to stop. You don't have to do something to be someone, God says in Leviticus 23. You can find your rest in me. And that's the first thing that God wants to give his people in Leviticus 23 in these celebrations. He wants to give them rest. Second thing that God wants to give to his people in Leviticus 23 in these celebrations. In these celebrations, God wants to give his people joy. In these celebrations, God wants to give his people joy. You know, there's this book by this very famous theologian. His name is C.S. Lewis. You may have heard of him before. He wrote a book many years ago called Surprised by Joy. And I love the picture that he paints of joy in this book. He says joy is kind of like a hummingbird. Uh, C.S. Lewis writes this, uh, joy dashes in. With the agility of a hummingbird claiming its nectar from the flower and then zips away. It pricks and then it vanishes, leaving a wake of mystery and longing behind it. And the reason that I love this quote so much is because C.S. Lewis describes a couple of things about joy. On the one hand, he talks about the glory of joy. And on the other hand, he talks about the problem with joy. The glory of joy is this. Sometimes joy is like a hummingbird. It can zip in and hit you when you least expect it. You're walking along early one morning looking up at the stars when all of a sudden the sky begins to turn all these fabulous colors. Reds and oranges and yellows and and blues. It lights up like a painting. And it's a beautiful sunrise and all of a sudden you stand there in awe and wonder. What have you just been struck by? You've just been struck by joy. It's the glory of joy right there in a sunrise. 
You're talking to somebody, a good friend of you, yours, and all of a sudden, uh, they let out this great one-liner that just makes you laugh so hard you cry. I mean, the joke is funny. You are busting a gut laughing. You are laughing so hard. What have you been struck with? You've just been struck by joy. It's hit you when you least expect it. But the glory of joy always gives way to the problem with joy, and the problem with joy is this. If if joy can zip in like a hummingbird and hit you when you least expect it, as quick as it zips in, it can also fly away. (laughs) And so you're walking along looking at that beautiful sunrise and all the colors in the sky, and the sun gets higher and higher and higher in the sky, and the temperature goes up and up and up on the ground, and all of a sudden you're standing there in 110 degree weather in a hot South Texas August, and you know what happens? Your joy flies away under a big pool of sweat. As quick as it comes, it can also go. Or you're talking to your friend, and they they let out that one-liner, and you laugh so hard you cry, but then right after you're talking to them, another friend calls you, and they, they, they share a tragic bit of news, and now all of a sudden you're not laughing and crying, you're just crying. As quick as that joy comes in, it also flies away. In these celebrations, God God is saying to his people, hey, joy is too valuable just to leave it to chance. I actually want you to schedule intentional moments of joy on your calendar. And so schedule these celebrations because these celebrations can focus you on joy. And we see this all over the celebrations. For example, the Feast of the First Fruits. One of the things that the priests in Israel would do during the Feast of the First Fruits, Leviticus 23, verse 11, he would take like a sheaf of grain, the first sheaf of grain, and he would wave it. He would do this number with it before the Lord. Now, have you ever been to a game, like a baseball game or basketball or football, and all of a sudden the fans in the stands, what do they begin to do? They begin to do this, and they begin to smile, and they begin to yell, and they begin to have a great time. What are they doing when they do this? They are doing something called the wave. Where did they learn it from? Leviticus 23. That's where they learned it from, I'm sure. They were just reading it the other day, so they decided to do it. But long before we did that at games, the ancient priests were doing it in ancient Israel. You know what that is? It's an intentional moment of joy. Or you go to the festival of the trumpets, the Jewish New Year. Leviticus 23, verse 24, God says, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you are to have a day of complete rest, commemoration, and and trumpet blasts. And I want you to pick up on this phrase, trumpet blasts. Uh, The Hebrew word for this phrase, trumpet blasts, is the word teruah. It refers to something that is blaring. In other words, not only is it loud... It is really loud. Now, I have two kids, Hope and Hayden. Hope is six, Hayden is three, and I've learned something about my kids. Uh, The level of their volume is directly proportional to the depth of their joy. You got that? In other words, the more joyous they are, the louder they become. Their laugh gets louder. The way they talk to each other gets louder. The way they squeal and yell at extremely high pitches gets louder until, you know what they're doing? They are teruwaing, they are blaring, and I have to say to them, hey, hey, tone it down. Too much joy in this house right now. (laughs) God says, here's how joyous I want you to be. I want you to blow trumpets so loud that they are teruwaing, they are blaring, and all the nations around you have to look at you and go, hey, hey, tone it down. There's so much joy in that nation right now. God is scheduling for his people intentional moments of joy because God knows that we all need joy. And so that's the second thing that God is trying to give through these celebrations. He's trying to give to his people joy. Last thing that God wants to give in these celebrations. In these celebrations, God is trying to give a center. In these celebrations, God is trying to give a center. 
Uh, so a few weeks ago, my family and I, we went on our annual trip to the beach in Port Aransas, and this is one of our favorite trips of the year. We get to stay, stay in a condo uh, that, that a family very graciously offers, and we look forward to this all year, every year. It is one of those great moments that we have as a family. Now, as, as the dad of the family, um, I always take pictures, like lots and lots of pictures while we're at the beach. Would you like to see some of my pictures? <laughs> you know what, I don't really care. I'm gonna show you my pictures. <laughs> and so uh, here, here's the first picture. Uh, I took that at about 6.30 in the morning when I'm lo- walking along the uh, Gulf Coast. Uh, that is the sunrise over the Gulf Coast. You know how I said, you know, sometimes a sunrise can give you a little moment of joy. That right there, when I had a cup of coffee in my hand walking up and down the beach and the sky turned all of those colors, that right there gave me one of those little moments of joy. Now, here's the thing. I like that picture. I think it's a beautiful picture. But most of the pictures that I take at the beach are not really like that, as beautiful as that is. Uh, Most of the pictures that I take at the beach are, are more like this or like this or like this. I like that one. Now, here's the thing. The scenery at the beach is beautiful. There are so many fun things to do at the beach. But when it comes to my time at the beach, as many fun things as there are to do, as beautiful as the scenery might be, all of that stuff is actually not the center of my celebration at the beach. You know what the center of my celebration at the beach is? Those two guys are. Now, here's the thing. When God gives his people all of these celebrations, he gives them lots of fun stuff to do in these celebrations. He says, hey, have a meal of lots of bread. Everybody likes bread. Or do the wave like this with the grain. Everybody likes to do the wave. Blow trumpet blasts and make them blaring. Everybody likes a roaring and raucous good time. But as fun as all of that stuff may be, none of that stuff is actually the center of the celebrations in Leviticus 23. Because there is only one one center of all the celebrations in Leviticus 23, and the center of all the celebrations is the Lord. He is the one who is always worth celebrating. In fact, notice what the Passover celebration is called. Leviticus 23, verse 5, it's called the Passover to the Lord. Why? Because He's the center of the celebration. Or notice what the Festival of Tabernacles is called in verse 34. It's called the Festival of Tabernacles to the Lord. Why? Because he's the center of the celebration. The Lord is mentioned 36 times in this one chapter. Because he is the center of every celebration. The Lord says, when you have me, you always have something to celebrate. Now, it actually goes even deeper than that. Because one day, there comes this Jew whose name is is Jesus. And Jesus, just like any good Jew in the ancient world, he would have observed all of these celebrations in Leviticus 23. But what he does is when he begins to celebrate these celebrations, he changes the meaning of them. He shifts them just a little bit in their center. And what he does is profound. Like when he's celebrating uh, the celebration of the Passover with his disciples. Now, when the ancient Israelites would celebrate the Passover, they would remember how the Lord has rescued them from their slavery out of Egypt. And when they left Egypt, they ate this unleavened bread. That was the center of their celebration. That was the story that formed the foundation of their celebration. But when Jesus takes this celebration with his disciples, he doesn't talk about the Exodus. He doesn't talk about ancient Israel. He doesn't talk about the Egyptians. He takes the bread of this celebration, the unleavened bread, and in Matthew 26, verse 26, he says, now wait, just a second. This bread is my body. In other words, this celebration that you thought was about Egypt, that you thought was about Israel, that you thought was about the Exodus, it's actually about me. I, Jesus says, am the new center of this celebration. 
Now, the next celebration on the ancient Israelite calendar was the celebration of the first fruits. And the celebration of the first fruits always happened on the Sunday after the celebration of the Passover. And that's when the priests, they would take the first of the fruits, the first of the grain, and they would offer them to the Lord. And they wanted to celebrate that because out of the ground had sprung this new life in the form of crops. And this life actually meant their lives because now they had something to eat. Four days after Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples, it's Sunday. It's the celebration of the first fruits. Three days after Jesus dies on a cross and is laid in the ground in a tomb, it's Sunday. It's the festival of the first fruits. And what should happen but out from the ground there comes life. And this new life, Jesus' resurrected life, gives us the hope and the assurance of eternal life. There's this great line from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, where he talks about the resurrection of Jesus. And he says, Christ has been raised from the dead. The what? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Where does Paul get that language from? Straight from Leviticus 23. Because as it turns out, Jesus is the center of every celebration. Now, here's the question we need to ask ourselves. If Jesus is the center of every celebration, what is the center of your celebration? When you party, who do you party with? You guys like physics? I got a little physics lesson, okay? Uh, in physics, there's something known as the center of gravity. You know what the center of gravity is? Uh, it's the point at which on an object, uh, the weight is evenly distributed around that point, and you can actually balance some pretty amazing things on a single point. Now, you see kind of examples of this combined with some other physics lessons, uh, like when you see one of those guys at the circus, right, and he takes a stick and he spins the plate on, on the stick. Now, there are lots of different things that are going on there with physics, like centrifugal force and other stuff like that, but one of the things that he's doing is, is he's finding the center of gravity, the center of the plate, and he's balancing the plate on that stick. Or, or you go to like a Globetrotters game and they take the ball, right, and they spin it on their finger. There are lots of different things that are going on there with physics, but one of the things you can see is you can see the center of gravity because they're balancing it right in the center of that ball. Now, here's the thing. The center of gravity is actually something that is very difficult to find. I cannot spin a ball on my finger. I cannot balance a plate on a stick. I can't do any of that. But it becomes even more difficult when the object that you are using is kind of a, a weird shape. Right, the objects they use, they're, they're symmetrical. But if you take an asymmetrical shape, it's really kind of impossible to find the center of gravity. And so I, I brought a little piece of wood here. Uh, this is kind of a funny shaped piece of wood. And if I was to try to balance this on my finger, there's, there's, there's no way I could do this. It's asymmetrical. It's really difficult to find the center of gravity on a piece of wood like this. But it's a funny thing. If I just take this little piece of wood and I add just a little bit of weight, like a belt. In fact, this thing was actually designed to hold a belt. And so, watch this. You can just kind of slip the belt right in there. And all of a sudden, look at that. I can balance the piece of wood. In fact, I can shift my finger back just a little bit more. I can still balance the piece of wood. What's going on here? Well, it's physics. You see, what I've done is I've shifted the center of gravity from the piece of wood itself to what the piece of wood is holding on to. And that makes all the difference. Now, maybe you're here this morning and quite frankly, you feel like you have nothing to celebrate. You could have walked in with a smile on your face, but maybe you really do have a little bit of scorn in your heart. Life just is miserable. You don't feel like you could ever party. 
Your job is hard. Your boss is a jerk. Your marriage feels like it's hanging by a thread. Your kids are rebellious. Your finances are stretched thin. The world, you just read the news stories, it's a mess. You feel like you got nothing to celebrate. If you feel in your life like it is so miserable and you are so sad and downtrodden and depressed and despondent and despairing that you don't have anything to party over, that you have nothing to celebrate with, you know what you need? You need Leviticus 23. Because in Leviticus 23, God is offering us an invitation. He is offering us an invitation to shift our center of gravity. Because let me tell you something. If your center of gravity is in you, if it's in your circumstances, you're never going to have much to celebrate. Because circumstances always shift. They always change. You can have a great day one day, and the next day, everything falls apart. And it just feels terrible. But if you shift your center of gravity from your circumstances and you to something you can hold on to, that makes all the difference. And so... In these celebrations, Jesus is beckoning you. Hold on to me. Cling fast to me, because with me, you always have a reason to party. No matter what your circumstances. And so, my brothers and sisters, may I remind you that what you celebrate is always to be centered in Jesus. He is a person who is always good to party with. And so, Party hard. (laughs) It'll be great. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we live in a world where sometimes it feels like we got nothing to celebrate, and yet when you are the center of our celebrations, when your son forms the focus of what we celebrate, we can have rest and we can have joy. We can have a center of gravity and a center for our lives, a hope for eternity. And so, Father, we pray, we pray that we would cling by faith to your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And now as you leave this place, remember, you go with Jesus. He is your center, and he's always worth a real good party. And so party with him and be blessed by him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. And now leave with that promise and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out God's precious word of life. Amen.